Moving on to the posterior pituitary. So thus far we have done the hypothalamus and the seven hormones that come from the hypothalamus, and then the anterior pituitary and the six hormones that come from the anterior pituitary. That's actually sort of the most complicated of the two endocrine organs. Um, and now we get to simplify just a little bit more. Um, now we're going to do the posterior pituitary. And remember that the posterior pituitary has an entirely different connection to the hypothalamus than the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary had capillary bed, portal vessel, capillary bed. So we would call that an, a vascular connection for, between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. But the posterior pituitary, again, it's really embryonically derived as really just a continuation of the hypothalamus. It's actually just white matter with a capillary bed at the end. So um, for that reason, it is often termed the neurohypothesis. Neuro as in nervous, hypothesis as in pituitary, so the nervous pituitary. So what it has, and we're gonna get into action potentials and everything, um, well, we already got into action potentials, but we'll actually talk about neurotransmitters a little bit later. But what's gonna happen is when these neurons have an action potential, they are actually going to secrete um, from the end of the axon, um, a chemical messenger that will then get picked up by the bloodstream, okay? And when these have an action potential, they will do the same thing. So um, the question here comes in, um, are these actually going to be neurotransmitters or are they going to be hormones? Well, they're not secreted right next to their target cell so they actually behave as hormones. Um, this is what your textbook often refers to as neurohormones, just because they're a hormone that's released by a neuron. But FYI, they are actually, they're hormones, okay? So they are actually hormones um, released from a neuron. And once they get into the bloodstream, it doesn't really matter where they came from. So they're actually hormones. So the chemicals that are released here were actually made up here in the cell bodies that are in the hypothalamus. And they're actually released by exocytosis down at the end in response to an action potential. And um, they are actually going to behave as hormones, not as neurotransmitters. And there's actually two of them. Um, they have a couple of different names for the first one. So the first one right here, um, and I don't need you to know the name, names of the in individual nuclei within the hypothalamus that make them. By the way, these are, again, to revi uh, revisit what we said at the very beginning of all the hormone stuff. These are actually considered posterior pituitary hormones even though they were made in the hypothalamus, but they're not released from the hypothalamus. They're released from the posterior pituitary. So the first ones, and these guys right here, um, well, actually the first one, it's just got two names. It's called ADH or vasopressin. So the vasopressin name tells you that it's a peptide because it ends in IN. Um, the ADH name will tell you sort of what it does. The vasopressin name also tells you um, one of its targets. So let's talk about that. So ADH, antidiuretic hormone. That's what goes there. Antidiuretic hormone. I'll write it for you just this time. antidiuretic hormone. Okay, so um, it is an antidiuretic. So an anti a diuretic makes you pee a lot. So this is an antidiuretic. So it actually causes you to conserve water, okay? And the antidiuretic hormone name sort of tells you where it goes. It doesn't have the tropic or tropin in it, but where do you think an antidiuretic could help you to conserve water? So yeah, it's going to go to the kidneys. That's one of its major targets, to help you conserve water. Um, the other thing that it does is um, it also um, is called vasopressin. Um, so let me write this down. I don't know why I didn't write it in there. Um, it 
It also causes vasoconstriction in many of your vessels in your body, so let's think about that for just a second. If at the kidneys, when it targets the kidneys, it causes water retention, what's that going to do to your blood pressure? It's going to increase it. And then when it targets the vessels as well, it's going to cause vasoconstriction. When it causes vasoconstriction at the vessels, what does that do to your blood pressure? It also raises your blood pressure. Now the message here is something that I'm going to reinforce as we go through the rest of hormones. And that is, if a hormone has more than one target, it's never going to undo at the second target what it did at the first. So let me explain that. If at the kidney, the net effect is to raise your blood pressure, and then you go to the vessels, do something consistent at the vessels with what you did at the kidneys. Would it be consistent to dilate the vessels? No, because I would have just raised my blood pressure with the kidney target, and then I would have decreased my blood pressure with the vessels target. So, if at the kidney, you cause water retention, which raises your blood pressure. The only logical thing to do at the vessels is vasoconstriction, which will also raise your blood pressure. And I will reiterate that as we go through a little bit um, uh, quite often. The other thing, I'll talk about this in just a minute. Um, we have figured out over the last few years that it also has a function in pair bonding and aggression between mammals. I'll come back to that in just a second, so hold on to that idea. Um, okay. So um, the feedback mechanism for ADH secretion. So this one's kind of interesting and it may not immediately click for you. The interesting thing about this one, the reason it's released is that these neurons up in the hypothalamus detect very concentrated blood plasma, like not enough water and too much solutes in your blood plasma. And they respond by saying, oh, I'm going to cause the release of ADH, which will of course cause water retention. That's one of the reasons it's, it's actually released. It's not the only one. Um, and so what will make these neurons stop secreting ADH is when they actually detect a change in the osmolarity of the blood. So if it was too concentrated, they will release it. If it becomes too watery, they will stop releasing it. So that is actually neural feedback. And so what starts and stops secretion? Kind of like, I mean, there's a couple of different ways that you could say it. Um, so let's just say the concentration of water in blood. And it's ba bas uh, basically detected by um, receptors, sensory receptors. Detected by sensory receptors. So even though it doesn't initially seem like it, it's actually um, a neural control mechanism. Um, okay, so let's t briefly talk about a disorder associated with ADH and the posterior pituitary. So the posterior pituitary, um, it could be the hypothalamus as well. Like if the hypothalamus up here is broken, it would of course cause problems with the, um, the secretion of ADH. But let's just assume that the problem is happening, I don't know, with release or something of it. So the posterior pituitary or the hypothalamus, if they are um, not able to release adequate levels of ADH, then you would have a hyposecretion of ADH, and it causes a disorder that you may or may not have heard of before. It's called diabetes insipidus, and diabetes insipidus is not a sugar or insulin-related diabetes at all. The word diabetes basically means you pee a lot, okay? And the word um, insipid here means bland. So um, if you pee a lot, but your pee is bland, then you would have been diagnosed with diabetes insipidus. So let's put this together. So if I can't release enough ADH, then I am going to basically not have enough antidiuretic to hold on to my fluids, which will make me pee a lot. But unlike diabetes mellitus, and mel means sweet, when I pee a lot, my pee is going to be very bland, which implies what you think it implies, that somebody was tasting 
the P way back when. That was probably not the person who took and passed physiology. So stay in school. Um, so diabetes insipidus is caused by a hyposecretion of ADH and you will pee like a racehorse and get super duper dehydrated and it can cause ion imbalances because you get so dehydrated. It is, however, treatable. You will have to add back um, the ADH. Um, so people can be treated with this. It's nowhere near as common as either type 1 or type 2 diabetes mellitus, which we will talk about, of course, when we get to the pancreas. Okay, and the other one that is released from the posterior pituitary is um, oxytocin. And oxytocin is, again, what I'm wearing around my neck. Um, and oxytocin um, is secreted from the posterior pituitary. And we've known about it for decades in its relationship to birth, parturition, and um, breastfeeding. But it actually does more things than that. So let's talk about the things that we've known for a long time, and then we'll expand on that knowledge. So it does cause breast milk release, which means breasts are uh, one of the targets. So it's not like prolactin is prolactation. It makes you lactate, but this actually causes the breast milk letdown. So uh, if you've ever heard of like a woman starting um, her breast milk starting to let down when she hears a baby cry, um, that's oxytocin. Um, it also causes contraction of the vagina during or orgasm, and it causes trust and bonding between people. And then the way that you've learned about it is, um, although this isn't happening daily during birth or parturition, it is a little oxytocin positive feedback loop that actually causes labor and delivery. That's not going to be relevant for most of your life, right? So the other functionality that we talk about, it actually causes contraction of the vagina during orgasm and it causes trust and bonding between people and also between other mammals, interestingly. So I wanna go back to the thing that I didn't really address with uh, vasopressin and oxytocin because um, interestingly, we figured out that these do a lot more than just, for instance, this one, um, water retention and regulating your blood pressure or this one with um, breast milk release or just during orgasm. These are mammalian bonding hormones, but the way that they cause bonding is different and they are released in different proportions generally in the two sexes. A lot of the work on these two has been done in other mammals, but now we are starting to understand what they actually do in humans. So oxytocin um, is responsible for sort of pair bonding between people. It is released um, a bunch of different ways. A really dependable rele way to release it is skin to skin contact. That's part of what you're trying to do. For instance, if you have a newborn infant, put them on the mother's um, chest or on the father's chest or on a sibling. This um, will cause oxytocin release in both and helps them to bond to one another. It's interesting. You also will release oxytocin with about 20 seconds of skin-to-skin -skin contact with someone that you like. If you do not like this person, it will cause the release of stress hormones. Of course, that means that it is released during sex because there's skin-to-skin um, -skin contact. And there's a big shot of oxytocin that is released during orgasm in both sexes. Um, and, um, Functionally, oxytocin tends to be released in higher quantities in females than in males, in most mammals, in humans included. And it is responsible for pair bonding because interestingly, if you think about sort of the history of placental mammals, is that with um, the female placental mammal, sex brings the possibility of pregnancy, yes? Um, at least certain types of kinds of sex, and I don't think that oxytocin knows actually the difference. So typical um, vaginal intercourse brings the possibility of pregnancy. Oxytocin is released during orgasm and also during skin-to-skin -skin contact. It makes it more likely that you are going to pair bond with that person because if you think about it, um, pregnancy is uh, resource intensive and dangerous and you are not quite as capable physically during the last portions of a pregnancy. So it's really nice to not have to do it alone if you are a placental mammal. So that's a good kind of bonding for the female <coughs> of the placental mammal. <coughs> and males do release oxytocin as well. 
Human males, though, um, typically release, not every human male, but uh, a lot of human males uh, upon orgasm actually release more of this other chemical called vasopressin. I don't know why they always call it vasopressin when it's related to sex. Um, and what vasopressin does is it's a different form of um, pair bonding. It's not like that's my boo pair bonding. What it does is it tends to um, increase territoriality and male-male aggression. So when a male releases this, which theoretically he would upon orgasm with a female, um, increases territoriality and increases male-male aggression. And the way to think about this with mammals is if a male is going to end up devoting time resources to raising offspring, whose offspring would he want to raise? His own. So I think of oxytocin as that's my boo, and I think of vasopressin kind of as that's my bitch. And um, both sexes release both of them. Typically, the proportions in a female, not every female, are more oxytocin than vasopressin, and in a male, not every male, are more vasopressin than oxytocin, just because of sort of evolutionary differences between the sexes. Okay, so last tidbit about this, the chemical class of hormones, there's only two, oxytocin and ADH. They're both peptides. Notice that at least one of the two names for each of them ends in IN, oxytocin, vasopressin. Um, and your assignment, of course, is now you can fill in the hormone release, the alternate name example, the major target or targets, the effect. Um, and then there is one disorder, just diabetes insipidus that goes with ADH and not um, oxytocin. Okay.